Welcome to the Synod Virtual Healing and Hope Retreat. I am so pleased that you have joined us. My name is Archbishop Bernard Hebda, Archbishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis. This retreat has been developed as part of our Archdiocesan Synod process. When the pandemic led us to change our Synod schedule, it provided us with a window for new opportunities to open our hearts more widely, to prepare us for how the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us in the upcoming consultative stage of the Synod process. This Healing and Hope virtual retreat is the second of four offerings that we are making available during this year. The Church prepares for the purpose of both preparing for the Synod consultations and for growing in our faith on a personal level. With the latter in mind, this retreat is not only a timely virtual resource for the Synod, but also one of enduring value. I hope that some of you are watching this long after the Synod is completed, and we are enjoying already the fruit of the Synod's hard work. We entered into the Synod process following a difficult time in our Archdiocese. In recent years, our hearts have been pained as deeply hurtful actions that had occurred over decades, but had been largely kept in the darkness of secrecy, were finally brought to light. The survivors, those members of the body of Christ of our church, who were most deeply affected, as well as many of their close families and friends, had already been intensely hurting for years, even decades, because of what was done to them. The church faced a public reckoning for those sins, one that has likely hurt all of us in some way. Regardless of how you have been hurt by the scandal, I am sorry for what you personally have been through as a result of the sins of my brother priests or of those working in the church. I ask your forgiveness for the ways in which our archdiocese failed to protect those who are most vulnerable and failed to live as credible stewards of the gospel. I can assure you that we have taken significant steps to prevent such hurtful actions from happening in the future and we are continuing our efforts to minister to and to bring God's healing love to those who were wounded. This retreat is one of the many ways we are attempting to do that. With that recent history so painfully fresh, we had anticipated that in the pre-Synod prayer and listening events, we would have heard more about the pain and the need for healing. And one courageous survivor did share a beautiful prayer for healing at most of those events. Surprisingly, while not forgotten, the calls for healing did not rise to the level that many other issues did as we look to the future. Consequently, healing is not one of our principal focus areas for the Synod's consultative process. Yet, I know there are still wounds in many hearts, and supported by the insights of the Synod prayer team, it seemed clear that we should not move forward in the Synod process without addressing the need to promote further healing and hope in our archdiocese. The events of 2020, including the pandemic, the death of George Floyd, and our national political divisions, have further highlighted the importance of healing and of being people of hope. All of us have been wounded in life in all sorts of ways. Some of those wounds are major, such as those experienced by those who were victims of abuse. Other wounds may seem smaller, but can still be impactful. Jesus came to earth not only to save us for eternity, but to make possible healing and restoration in this life as well. He did that because each one of us is wounded, each one of us has been hurt, and each one of us can benefit from an encounter with Jesus' healing love. Pope Francis spoke of the challenges and the resulting wounds in our church and in the people of God in our time. Our Holy Father said about our wounds, look at them, touch them to touch the wounds of the Lord in our wounds, in the wounds of our society, our families, our people, our friends. Touch the wounds of the Lord there, he said. In this retreat, we will be invited to touch those wounds, and that is not easy, for we often want to avoid wounds and the pain that goes with them. But like with so many things in life, that which is hard so often is what allows us to grow. That is a long way of saying, even though Jesus invites us to come to him with our burdens, it takes courage and trust to embark upon a retreat like this, as it invites us to look at some challenging things that have happened in our lives. I commend you for taking this first step, and I encourage you, like our patron St. Paul, 
to persevere through the challenges, keeping your eyes on Jesus to the end. So what helps us to keep our eyes on Jesus in our struggles? The theological virtue of hope that was implanted in our hearts at baptism. Hope is tested, yet it's necessary and ultimately can grow when we encounter challenges, such as facing painful memories of our past, such as facing a pandemic, such as facing civil unrest and societal injustice. The Catechism defines hope as the theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness, placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying not on our own strength, but on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. When we hear how God has acted in the lives of others, such as our father in faith Abraham, who hoped against hope and became the father of many nations, our hope can grow. When we hear stories of people in our times and when we experience God's faithfulness personally, our hope can grow. It is my prayer that the virtue of hope will be more strongly grounded and enkindled in your heart as we walk through this retreat. In the Praying with Scripture virtual series, Bishop Cousins and I described how to more deeply encounter God in prayer. In this retreat, we will sharpen that focus to bring things that bind us to the Blessed Mother and entrust our wounds to an encounter with Jesus, with the healing and hope that can result. Fittingly, I'm giving this introduction in the chapel of the Archdiocesan Catholic Center, a place of prayer under the patronage of Our Lady Undoer of Knots. Most of the talks will be given in St. Joseph Hall here at the Archdiocesan Catholic Center. This is also fitting since during this year our Synod and Archdiocese is being placed under the patronage of St. Joseph, Mary's earthly protector and guide. Before we go any further, let us take a moment to pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the ways that you love, enlighten, guide, and encourage us here on earth. Help us to overcome any fears we might have to seek love and healing, any fears we might have in facing some of the deepest hurts and challenges of our lives. Grant us the courage to allow the light of Christ to shine into our darkness. Help us to trust in your love, fidelity, and power, that when we make ourselves vulnerable and surrender our challenges to you, you will transform them in miraculous ways. May we believe your promise that God works out all things for good for those who love him. Help us to believe more deeply that our fundamental identity and our fundamental worth is found only in you and your love for us. It's not what others think of us or even what we do. Open our hearts and minds to the words that you want us to hear on this retreat and grant us the wisdom and courage to act in keeping with them. May we not be discouraged and may we remain patient if you and your love desire to heal us in a gradual way rather than all at once. Help us instead to delight in whatever progress is made during this retreat. With your power, break bondages that are trapping us in the past and help us evermore to be people of mercy and forgiveness. In the face of our hurts, in the face of the challenges we are facing individually and as a society, fan into flame the virtue of hope you placed in our hearts at baptism, that we may remain grounded in you and your loving provision for us. We ask all this seeking the intercession of St. Paul, patron of our archdiocese, St. Joseph, protector and guide of the Holy Family, St. Raphael, patron of healing, and through Christ our Lord, amen. Our Lady, undoer of knots, pray for us. It's now my pleasure to introduce Father Joseph Bambinek, who is the Assistant Director of the Synod. He will guide us through this retreat. Thank you. Thank you, Archbishop Hebda, and thanks to each of you who are participating in this retreat. Echoing the Archbishop's comments, I commend you for having the courage to embark upon the journey of healing and hope. For as with any adventure, this journey involves a bit of risk, but I trust you will find it is well worth it. Now, the framework for this retreat was developed several years ago when I was pastor of St. Pius X Church in White Bear Lake 
and was blessed to be granted a sabbatical to help develop a parish-based healing retreat. So I will serve as the guide on this journey, but most of the content will be presented by other local speakers who have deep insights on the topics that are being covered. Along the way, you will also hear testimonials of sisters and brothers in Christ who have struggled but have also experienced healing and hope in their lives. These testimonials remind us that we are not alone in our pain and struggles and that God is alive in our lives today. They remind us of the transformational power of our loving God. Before we listen to today's speakers, I will map out the path for you of what we will cover in these next five sessions. Today, we will hear about how God created us in love as individuals and as a church, to live in relationship with one another and with Him. Yet, we are to live out this love in a fallen world. In the following sessions, we will talk through some of the wounds that result from living in a fallen world, realizing that we all suffer as much as we like to avoid it. Now, when we are wounded, it's easy to focus on the pain and not how on God's grace can work through the wounds, nor on how we can be resilient. Regardless of what has happened to you, you are not alone in your suffering, nor in your wounds, and those wounds can be transformed. Now, a powerful quote I learned from the team at the John Paul II Healing Center is that wounds that are not transformed are transmitted. Put another way, if we don't allow God's love to transform our wounds, we will stay stuck in our suffering and then often transmit our suffering on to others. Now, when we are hurt, we often seek to protect ourselves in the short term, but those actions often stifle and isolate us in the long run. So during this retreat, we will identify common strategies we use to protect ourselves that ultimately limit us. And then we will be invited to turn them over to Our Lady Undoer of Knots and entrust our wounds to her Son, to Jesus' sacred heart. The pinnacle of this retreat, the greatest of the sights we will see, I pray, is an encounter with Jesus and his love. For ultimately, it is only true love that can heal our emotional and spiritual wounds. There is great reason for hope. Yes, it is a pretty packed itinerary. And at times, especially starting with the next session, the material may be heavy. If you find it becomes too much to take in all at once, there is no shame in stopping the video for a while. Perhaps write in a journal to process some of the emotions you might be feeling. Perhaps take a walk to think about the information in the presentation. But if you do go for a walk, please make sure that you're more collected before you start walking around moving vehicles or before you get behind the wheel of a vehicle yourself. Now, each session will be in about an hour in length. They will generally consist of two talks, followed by a testimonial related to each talk. We will prompt you at a natural break about halfway through if you're finding it heavy and want to hit pause for a bit. The beauty of a virtual retreat is that you can then pick up whenever you're ready to move forward in a few minutes, in a few hours, in another day. There are also resources to help on the journey. On the Synod webpage, archspm.org synod, and mobile app, you can find a resource list which includes lists of book titles, healing ministries, Catholic therapists, retreats, and a general referral line that could be of assistance. These resources are there in part in case issues come to mind or heart during this retreat that leave you desiring help but not knowing where to turn. They are also there to provide ideas for next steps on the journey of healing and hope, which is in many ways a journey that lasts until we arrive in heaven, we pray. In addition, on the webpage and app, for each talk, there's a note-taking friendly outline with some questions that can be used for personal reflection or as discussion starters if you're watching the sessions with a small group or want to talk about these topics with family or friends. So as we travel the path of healing and hope, 
I invite us to be primarily focused on our own lives, our own wounds and bindings, as well as God's love for us and the path of healing he's inviting us to take. But this retreat might also give insights on those closest to us. Now, fixing others should not be our mindset. But by being be better, better able to understand those around us in their pain and woundedness, we can better empathize with them and better love them. For if we have more insight on others and their pain, we can be more patient with them when they act out of their woundedness. And we can also perhaps gently give them ideas on where to point them in the direction of healing for themselves. Now with that long introduction, let us move into the content of today's session. We will first hear from Father John Vanderplug, Assistant Director of Spiritual Formation at the St. Paul Seminary. He will talk about our fundamental identity as sons and daughters of our loving Heavenly Father in a fallen world of how we are loved by God wherever we are at in life. Melina Argreo will share with us how seeing herself as a beloved daughter of God changed her life. After Melina's testimonial, there will be a natural break time if you want to stop the video before moving on to the second portion of today's session. In the second talk, Natalie Waters Lang, an experienced campus minister who holds a master's degree from the University in Poland, where St. John Paul II taught, will present on the importance of living out our faith in relationship, in community, recognizing that the church is the body of Christ. Ryan Hamilton will follow Natalie by giving a testimonial on his experience of the church as the body of Christ. I will return to close out the session before Bishop Cousins sends us on our way with the final prayer and blessing. I want to speak to you today about our original identity as sons and daughters of God. We are created in God's image and we are created good. And it's a question we all have to face actually is do I actually believe that? Not just do I believe that God said that, but do I believe that in the way I live my life? and in the way I think about God viewing me. God does not just tolerate me, but he actually loves me. And through Jesus Christ, I can become a son or daughter of him. Do I really believe that I can have that kind of relationship with God? And this is a unique gift, and we're greatly valued, but in the midst of the world, this reality is trampled underfoot. St. John Paul II was writing to a friend of his, um, Henry de Lubac, and he said to him that the evil in our times is the degradation even the pulverization of the uniqueness of the individual person. So this unique gift that we are is opposed out in the midst of the world. And I experience this in all kinds of different ways as I walk through life. And some of them are so kind of prevalent and so subtle that I don't necessarily notice them. So it makes it important for me to intentionally be aware that I am a son or daughter of God and that I'm a unique gift that God loves. Because there are other things being communicated to me that oppose this, such as I am worth only what I produce or I am not actually good. God tolerates me because he has to love everybody because it's forced upon him in some way. But he doesn't really love me individually. He puts up with me. But the truth is God does love each and every one of us. And he wants to use you 
in a very special way. So a good way to even pray for this is, Lord, do all that you want in me and through me. Because God loves me and he wants me to know his love and he wants to love others through me. He wants what is best. But there is something fallen in us where I think that I have to be my own solution, that I have to save myself, that I have to be my own source to rescue myself or to make myself good enough so that God will notice me and be pleased with me. I have to look out for myself, pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And this is a lie and it's false. Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, we see that they're created good, but they make choices where they don't actually believe this gift of God's love fully. And they choose themselves above God. And this disobedience is a distrust of God. It's a trust in myself instead of God. That God is not for me and I need to protect myself from him. And this is a wrong turn that they take. They misuse their freedom. But the first wrong turn that they made was actually listening to the serpent in the garden. And the truth is, for all of us, when we begin to hear these voices, you're not loved, you're not good, you have to do all this on your own, that as soon as we notice that, we want to reject that. And one way I think about rejecting it is if that thought is like at the front door and rings the doorbell, that I turn around and walk out the back door immediately. And if I begin to just, even the moments that I notice it, if I do that, I can grow in more freedom and in more peace. Because the truth is that I pursue all kinds of false things because I don't believe that God will actually be there or that he actually loves me and I have to fill myself. And then we see Adam and Eve, when they recognize that they have sinned and they're fallen, they become aware of this and they hide from God. And we can do this in all kinds of ways, that I actually run and hide from God. I try and improve before I come to him. When I was a kid, I had a couple of friends and we made this fort. It was very simple, kind of few logs piled on top of each other, but we were really into this. And we learned to dig these little traps around it in case anyone would come in, want to come into our little fort, which I don't know why they would. And what we do is we dig this hole and then put some sticks and some leaves over it so that if they came up on our little log cabin that they would trip and hurt their ankle. And one Saturday, we, we started to get really good at this. And so right behind my friend's house in the alley, we spent all Saturday digging. And we dug this huge hole that was probably 10 feet deep, probably four feet wide. And we dug and dug, and then we found sticks. We covered over the hole and then put leaves over it. And then being kids, we ran off and we went to play. And we forgot that we had that hole. And my mom got a call a couple of days later, and she just asked me, did you boys dig a hole in the alley? And I said, yeah, we did, but we filled it in. And she said, well, I don't think you did because Mr. Gearling's in the hospital. And so this poor man, very nice man, Mr. Gearling, Monday morning is walking to work through the alley. 
And all of a sudden, he steps on these branches and falls into our hole, broke some ribs. So you can imagine how startled he must have been, where he's right there, shocked, injured, at the bottom of this hole. And the truth is, this is where we all live, actually. We live in that place of being broken. And the choice we have is really, do I try and climb out of that hole even though I'm broken, even though I'm injured? Or do I invite Jesus to come into that hole with me? And together, he can draw me out of it. And this is really the choice that we have all the time, that I can invite Jesus into any wound, any pain, any situation. And the focus can be on him instead of just on me and my need to rescue myself. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Jesus is there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And every place of brokenness in my life is a place that Jesus can be right there and knocking. I cannot do it on my own. But do I try and overcome my weakness to get to God? Or do I let him come to me? in the midst of my being broken, in the midst of my needing him. The Lord wants to come to us. And St. Teresa, the little flower, said, St. Therese, she said a fascinating thing. She said, if I committed the worst sin in the history of the world, my response would be to run and jump into the lap of God the Father that she actually had this clear sight that in the midst of brokenness, her response was to run toward God, not away from him. And so for each of us, the Lord invites this great gift, this great gift of knowing him and of knowing his love. And not only knowing his love when I have everything together, but knowing his love when I greatly need him. So when we pray, we can pray in a way that's, Lord, rescue me. Lord, even rescue me from myself. That the Lord's pleased with that kind of prayer. But often we judge ourselves and measure ourselves or even judge and measure others. That it's somehow what I'm going to accomplish. When actually what the Lord wants to do it's just like where Mr. Gearling was, where he's in that hole and injured, that he wants to come down and grab me, draw me to himself, so that first I'm not alone there, and that I can enter into relationship with him as his son or daughter more deeply. One way we can be more aware of this is through prayer, where we can come to see the Lord more clearly. St. John Vianney had a farmer in his parish who would sit and pray in the church all the time. And he would pray before the tabernacle and he asked him once, what are you doing? How do you, how do you pray? And he just said quite simply that I look at him and he looks at me. And this is actually how we're freed. When I look at him, I can see myself more clearly. When I look at him, he can come to me. But oftentimes it's shifted to where instead of I look at him and he looks at me, it becomes he looks at me and I look at me. And that ends up closing things in on myself. Silence is a way that we can really grow. And where there's that silence, we can hear things. Sometimes it might be things that are painful. It might be anger. It might be fear. It might be concern. And it might be hope or joy. 
But silence is kind of like a magnifying glass on our heart. That when we have that, it lets us see where our need for the Lord is. And we can go back to that scripture, Revelation 3.20. Of whatever comes up, we can say, Lord, I know you're knocking there, and I want to invite you in. Come to me here. So let's look at every situation in our lives and ask the Lord to come to us. Jesus, be with me here. I invite you to come to me to bring your love, your truth, and your peace. Amen. It was in ninth grade that I started to have this sense of just feeling less than, like less, less pretty than others and less athletic or less fun or less good. Um, and I just, I wanted to belong and I wanted to be wanted and known and accepted. And I was always comparing myself to others. Um, and I didn't want to be forgotten. Um, and so the, those fears and desires led me to do things that would um, give me that recognition and um, acceptance that I wanted um, and admiration from people. And so I ended up dating a guy in ninth grade who I got very attached to. And it was a very toxic and unhealthy relationship. But the relationship gave me this recognition and these thrills that were talked about by people. And so I felt known and I felt like people wanted me. Um, and so I dated him for three years. And eventually the thrills of the relationship began to feel really redundant and cheap. Um, and my peers didn't really care about my life and people weren't really talking about us anymore or about what Melina was doing on the weekends um, and no one really knew me anymore um, and so one night I my friend was dropping me off at home after just a typical weekend with my boyfriend and his friends and I was exhausted and I went straight to my room and I was sitting there and just recollecting and trying to think about what did I do this weekend, you know, that's worthy, that's good, and I'm going to be recognized for and talked about for. And, and in that moment, I had a mirror. I had a mirror in my room, and I was sitting there, and I just looked up at the mirror, and I just remember, like, not recognizing myself. Like, just, it was the weirdest thing. Just, like, who have I become um, and for what? And so in that moment, I thought to myself, is this what I have to keep doing to be known and to be recognized and affirmed? And God took that brief moment of doubt um, and he just flooded my heart with acceptance and real love. And it was a peace unlike I've ever experienced before. Um, for so long, I was trying to like accumulate thrills and, um, you know, and events and things. To, to prove my worthiness to myself and to others. Um, and in that moment, it was like I was reminded, he reminded me that, that I'm worthy simply because I am his. Um, and it had nothing to do with what I could do. It just was that way. And he saw me and recognized me perfectly and accepted me, um, which is what I was longing for. Um, and he delighted in me. That was something that, um, I remember just like, wow, he like delights in me. Like I am good, you know, as a father delights in his daughter. And so um, my life changed from that night on. I discontinued my relationship with the guy I was with. I had to discontinue a lot of the friendships I had. And, and that was hard. Senior year was very lonely, but it was very peaceful because I felt free and I didn't feel like I had to keep chasing after things, you know, that ultimately actually didn't make me feel very good. Um, and I realized in that moment that we're all fully loved and accepted and affirmed and validated um, by our Father in Heaven. And we don't need to do anything to, to acquire that. Um, and the, so from then on, I felt, I felt truly free. Um, 
and like I, I no longer felt the need to impress anyone um, to feel loved or to feel accepted because I, I just was. Um, I was by my creator and that transformed me from then on. But it, it sounded like my life was perfect. You know, there was a lot of healing that had to be done um, addressing kind of the garbage that I had been in for three years and every every healing is is kind of a victory um, and I feel more free I feel more pure um, and more yeah, more at peace So it's ironic to be speaking about community in a room that is relatively empty uh, on a screen, but I'm delighted to be here sharing with you about the church as the body of Christ. Um, I think that hearing what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God, we would be remiss not to talk about the fact that the image of the Trinity is in fact a communion of self-giving love. And so we think about how God the Father loves the Son so much and that love is the Holy Spirit and that there are three distinct persons in perfect communion in the Trinity and that if we're made in the image and likeness of God, we are made in fact in an image of communion. And so it is good that you are here. Um, I wanna start as I start most talks in the catechism so this is in the umbrella section on the church, but there's actually a section called the church, the body of Christ. And though I was only gonna speak about the things that have to do with communion, I think it's really important to start at the beginning of this section um, and you'll be able to find the references on the handout. So this is paragraph 787. From the beginning, Jesus associated his disciples with his own life revealed the mystery of the kingdom to them and gave them a share in his mission, joy, and sufferings. Jesus spoke of a still more intimate communion between him and those who would follow him. Abide in me and I in you. I am the vine and you are the branches. And he proclaimed a mysterious and real communion between his own body and ours. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I am him. I think it's really beautiful that the way that the church speaks about the mystical body of Christ also reveals to us that Jesus giving himself to us in the Eucharist as the body of Christ is what fuels that communion and the way that we are called to be together as a church at mass in the liturgy is something that is completed because when we receive the Lord, we become like him. The Catechism goes on in paragraph 791 to say the unity of the mystical body produces and stimulates charity among the faithful. From this it follows that if one member suffers anything, all the members suffer with him. And if one member is honored, all the members together rejoice. Finally, the unity of the mystical body triumphs over all human divisions, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What the heck does that mean? So when we think about the unity of the mystical body, we think about the way that we share our life together. We participate in the body of Christ through our relationships. Actually, the way that I ended up in the Twin Cities is that Steve Villa, now Brother Columba Marmion, gave a talk at a retreat that I was attending, and he said, no man or woman is in and of themselves an island. If you don't have community where you are, move. And I sunk to a puddle on the floor in the chapel and was like, Lord, where do you want me to move? because I kept trying to do it by myself and I kept trying to be the Lord's presence alone. And I heard very distinctly the Lord say, 
why not Minnesota? And they started weeping. I was like, I don't want to move to Minnesota. And yet I have left and come back at least three times. And no matter how many times I try to leave, I keep finding myself back here because this is the place where the body of Christ has been my soft place to land. There are so many beautiful resources and elements and people involved not only in just this retreat, but in my life in so many facets in the Twin Cities that have built me up and shown me God's love for me and for his church. Another really important place that we can encounter the Lord is in small groups. So I was in a small group during college and we talked about a concept called Johari's window. So in Johari's window, you draw, everybody draws a square of what they think they are and a square of what they think everyone in the room is. And there are four quadrants in the square and they can all vary in sizes. So the four quadrants are secret. So the things that only God knows about you, that you don't know, that nobody else knows, only God knows, they're yet to be revealed. They're the things that are hidden, the things that are just between you and God. And then there are the things that are blind. So these things are obvious to everyone else, but not necessarily something that you see. And then there's the open square. And in the open square, that's what you know about yourself and what everybody else knows about you. And I want to share with you a funny story for those of you who know me. When I had my first meeting with my boss as a campus minister in Philadelphia, my boss said to me, Natalie, you're really intense. And I was like, what? <laughs> like I thought of myself as this really easygoing person and no one ever told me because it was so obvious to them that I was intense that no one ever bothered to tell me. And I just like totally transformed my thought and opinion about myself because the perception that I had and the reality were just not in line. Um, and anyone who knows me knows that this is hilarious because that's like the first thing people notice when they meet me is that I'm intense. Um, I want to move on to the next point. To be known is to be loved. The fact that my boss was able to see me and to point out in me this thing that I wasn't aware of was really important because our friends see in us the things that we don't see. Um, in fact, one time, there, there was a year in the Twin Cities that I only had a bicycle and I took buses pretty much everywhere, which was awesome because I got to read on the bus a lot. And I was reading a book called Person and Being by Walter Norris Clark, which is a ex explanation of how Aquinas understands the person. So I'm a little nerdy, but the section I got to in this book, I just like furiously started underlining and it totally transformed my understanding of myself and my relationships was that sometimes we think we know ourselves. So we have a perception of ourselves, but that perception isn't how we know who we are. In fact, we can only be known in relationships, in relationships particularly to people who I would call this like a virtuous friendship. So the friends that were vulnerable enough that we let really see us. And that in those friendships, we are revealed to ourselves because I might have this perception of myself in the way that I think I am, easygoing, which is hilarious again. But in fact, I am driven and a strong leader and capable and intelligent. And these things are not things that I like see in myself when I look in the mirror. These are things that my community has reflected back to me in love. I think there are, um, there are other ways in which we are revealed to ourselves in communion and in relationship, and that is that the more we get to know Christ, the more we know ourselves. So when you spend time with Jesus, he reveals you to yourself. And the more you know who you really are, the more you're able to actually be Christ's presence in the world. And so we need to be spending time with the Lord and in relationships. So there, I think this is often spoken about, um, it's one of the kind of guiding principles of how I understand sin and redemption is that sin creates ruptures. So there's a rupture between myself and God, myself and myself, and myself and others. 
And when we're living communion well, and we're living in community that's strong and faithful, we are being built up in our relationship with God, which builds up our relationship with ourselves and allows us to have strong and true relationships with others. So we need Christ. We need to be Christ to the people that are in our lives. And we need to enter in to the radical way that he loves us and sees us as we are. Um, we are not created to be alone. I think that one way to do this is through parish life, through small groups, through communal worship, through participating in the body of Christ as a body. There's such a beautiful depth when you look around your parish and you see your friends and you're worshiping together and you're receiving the body of Christ, becoming the body of Christ, and you're transformed in communion. There are depths that are available when you are seen and known and loved in small groups. And even like the silly, awkward things like coffee and donuts and parish festivals, like to really lean in and reach out and be the presence of Christ to the people in your church. Like people don't show up there because they don't need you. We're a bunch of sinners that need help. And honestly, like getting to know those people and having them over for dinner parties, like friendship and communion and community aren't just things that we should do because we like them and they're fun. Um, these are things that we do because this is how we are participating in God's love for us and his creative way of acting in our lives. To love is to risk. And a lot of us have been hurt. Um, I think about the way that trauma impacts my own community and I feel like I see it in a few different ways. But one of the things is that I'm imperfect, unfortunately. Um, and my imperfections hurt the people that I love. And I'm hurt by the imperfections of others. And yet, God uses me anyway. He shows up and allows me in my brokenness to enter into relationships, to be able to empathize, to be able to suffer with, and to be able to love and laugh with the people that he has put in my life. I think that for me, my community in the Twin Cities is the soft place to land when I go out on these like missionary adventures to try to save the world and then fail because I'm not Jesus. And I come back and I'm received by this group of people who loves me unconditionally. Or I live with people who trigger my wounds and poke at the things that are hard to show me exactly what I need to grow in and that there's still work to be done because the fact of the matter is we are made for heaven and I keep wanting to arrive at the light at the end of the tunnel, but that's when I die. Like there's always gonna be suffering. And so I think that it's not being discouraged that the things that you fail at, you're probably gonna keep failing at within reason, and that there's hope in that, and that the Lord allows us in our traumas to be able to rebuild relationships as they ought to be if we didn't have what we were supposed to have, particularly as kids. Um, I was reminded a number of times this summer that there is no manual for parenting and that no matter how hard you try, you're doing the best that you can and you're still probably screwing your kids up. It's not on purpose, it's just real life. Um, because we receive things differently and we're built differently. And I know that my parents never meant to give me these ridiculous traumas, but I struggle so much with this like rejection and self-hatred that I didn't realize was so rooted in my relationships with my family that is totally being rebuilt by the family that I live with in the Twin Cities, that is objectively looked at with my therapist, that is guided faithfully with spiritual directors, that is used beautifully in ministry, and that my community is both the place that I am built up and shown how to love, and the place that I carry my cross, because not everybody's easy to love. Um, I think the Catechism 
in paragraph 806 says beautifully why we need each other to heal. In the unity of this body, there is a diversity of members and functions, and all the members are linked to one another, especially to those who are suffering, poor and persecuted. I don't really think there's anyone in the world right now that's not suffering. And even if it's suffering the loss of what you thought things would be like, to be able to give yourself the grace to also give other people the grace because nothing is feeling okay for anyone. And no matter how that suffering is manifest in your life, someone is always carrying a cross. And so when we approach our community with the expectation that they're suffering with us, that changes how we come to them and the empathy that we're able to show them. I wanna talk next about the gifts that the Lord has bestowed upon the church by looking at Ephesians 4, uh, verses 1 through 7 and 11 and 12, because there's a weird part in the middle that's real theological and I don't know how to explain it. Um, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And he gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So I think oftentimes we look at ourselves and our life and we go, I wish I had that gift. Or I think that the gift that the Lord is using is a thing that actually gets in the Lord's way. And the thing that he uses is the thing that I'm trying to purify out of myself which is hilarious because I'm not God. And I keep trying to be like, this is how you should probably do it. And he's like, can you please just let me be the king of the universe and also the Lord of your life? But it's a lifelong process. It's not something that just like happens that we wake up one day and we're a saint. It's the faithful response to the gift that I have that nobody else has. I have received gifts from the Lord that have been given to me to work in the particular people in my life that he has put in my life. And this is really hard for me to accept that I am a gift and that I manifest God's image in a way that only I can. And that that's true for every person, that you are Christ's presence in the world, that you are part of God's life and the way that you live fully as who you are is actually making his glory known in the world. Like that's mind blowing and beautiful. And you have to say yes to him. Like, why wouldn't you? Freely, of course, you don't have to. You can block away, people do. Um, But in Catechism 794, it describes a way that we can ask the Lord to use us. Christ provides for our growth to make us grow toward him, our head. He provides in his body, the church, you and I, the gifts and the assistance by which we can help one another along the way of salvation. You were made for such a time as this, and the way that God is using you is also particular to the people that he puts in your life. I think in the world that we live in, again, Ironic, this talk is coming from a screen and not a place that I can like give you a hug afterward, even though that wouldn't be allowed right now anyway. Um, I, I just think it's so interesting that we live in this culture where we can like have access to everyone, but then we miss the person that's right in front of us. So who is next to you in your pew that looks forlorn? Like, talk to them. Um, everybody feels dumb making the first move. Do it anyway. And don't be surprised when God wants to use you in your brokenness and through your suffering. 
So to recap, the mystical body is most present when we receive Jesus. So lean into your community and enter into your parish life. God reveals us to ourselves in our relationships, both our relationship with him and our relationship with others. And in our relationship with ourselves, like, do I love myself with the radical love that God has for me? And you have a role to play that nobody else can. So be who you are and be that well. God entrusts, to us, God entrusts us to each other specifically. He puts us in the places that he desires us to be, to love the people that he desires us to love. Um, I actually really encourage you all to pray with John 17. So I'm not going to read it, but my challenge in this talk is to think about do you have a good group of friends? Like, do you feel like you're part of the mystical body of Christ? Do you know the gifts that you have been given that are unique to you and the way that you are God's presence in the world? And do you actually see in your prayer time the way that God sees you? To be known is to be loved and you are loved by the king of the universe. Thank you. I'm, I'm obviously a, a black man. <laughs> as, uh, as, as they say in America. Um, and just the Catholic Church has always been my home and refuge uh, in this country in spite of everything that um, it's going on society-wise and personally dealing with race. I've always felt a member of the family and part of and belonging in the Catholic Church. So that gives me great hope and it's helped heal some of those wounds by um, I can always connect with my, my dignity and, and my, my status as a child of a higher creator when I'm going to Mass and involved in, in my faith. So, for me, when going to Mass and hearing the Gospels and the readings and the example Jesus set of always touching people and reminding them of their dignity and restoring their dignity in, in the midst of a society that was trying to rob that from them. Church has its own wounds, right? Which are, you know, go without saying. Um, I think it's, you have to confront the wound, which takes courage, but in my experience, I've as I've delved deeper into my faith and my relationship with Christ, that's given me great courage because I know like, ultimately I'm going to be taken care of. And so with that courage and with Jesus having my back, I can start really digging and peeling the onion on, these, on the wounds and, and really trying to take the Band-Aid off and, and dive in and try to heal those wounds because uh, it's frightening to confront these things. It's frightening to talk about these things. But if you're grounded in Christ, then yeah, what, are you, what do we have to be afraid of? So I think that's the, the, the solution, is just to seek courage in our faith, and that will allow us to confront the wounds. We have to be leaders in, 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 um, in setting an example that our children can see so that the world is healed. The greatest gift of experiencing the body of Christ has come through uh, I volunteered as a, a, a Eucharistic minister at the Basilica. It's a huge church, hundreds of, of people in Mass. And to hold up the host and say the body of Christ to a hundred people of all different heights, weights, skin tones, colors, backgrounds, it just hit me over the head that, oh, this is the body of Christ. All these different people that are so different that make up our church. That's the body of Christ. And so I invite everyone. You don't have to make it a permanent commitment, but at least once. <laughs> Serve communion. Um, and, and hopefully go to a, maybe a downtown parish where you'll get different demographics and hold the host up and look folks in the eye and say the body of Christ. Because it transformed me way more than, <laughs> than anything that I was doing to project to them uh, just to see Again, 
sh short, tall, white, black, immigrant, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Like Ryan, this is the body of Christ. It just confirmed my, what the church has really always given me, that I'm a part of something bigger that society may not acknowledge. It just reminded me and, and, and really affirmed in my heart of the power of, of communion and of this, the, the Catholic Church, you know, just in terms of for everybody. And we all make up this body, you know, and um, it's not persons of a particular dem social demographic. It's a commonality of faith and heart and belief. Um, and it just really fired me up to, that's why I'm here doing things like this and speaking how I speak, because I just, I, I, love my, I love my country and I love my church, and I think our church can be the, really the, the institution that helps, change, helps heal this country. Somebody asked me, like, oh, aren't you worried that the Catholic Church has kind of lost credibility due to some of the scandals? Well, that, that was actions of men and, and women. The church is bigger than any action of any one man or even a few men or women. Um, and even if that's true, bam, we have this time of civil and racial and political unrest in our country. What an awesome way to kind of reconcile that <laughs> by stepping into that fray as leaders and good examples of you don't have to be perfect and you can all it's never too late to heal and do the right thing and so if that's the example we can set maybe we can right some of our wrongs thank you father vanderplug natalie melina and ryan for your encouraging talks and your inspiring testimonials thank you as well for watching today now if you wish to do a brief exercise there's a video explaining it on the synod website along with talk outlines and questions for discussion or small group reflection. I hope that you will join us again next week. And Bishop Cousins will now lead us in a closing prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for having lovingly created each of these beautiful, cherished, and precious daughters, these beloved and respected sons of yours. We thank you for creating each of us to be unlike any other, for a great purpose that no one else was created to fulfill. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son to suffer, die, and rise for us. Thank you for loving each one of us personally, so much so that Jesus would have suffered and died for us even if we were the only person on earth. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to guide the church Jesus established. May we each do our part to build up the unity on earth in the mystical body of Christ so that we as the church can be who you want us to be for the world and come to live forever with you in heaven. In these coming days, help us to see and experience more deeply our great dignity and purpose and deepen our resolve to overcome what gets between us. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Our Lady, undoer of knots, pray for us. May the Lord be with you, and may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Go in peace. God bless you.